my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped thousands of new and expecting moms find the perfect pump for their lifestyle. They offer all major pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, and more. And the best part is they take care of everything, including getting all the required paperwork, dealing with your insurance company, and explaining your options in order to get your free pump shipped straight to your door. And an extra bonus is you may also qualify for free maternity compression garments like compression socks, maternity support bands, and a postpartum recovery garment, plus breast pump resupply products ranging from new bottles, tubing, and flanges to duct valves and pump membranes. All you have to do is go to Aeroflow Breast Pump's website and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Be sure to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour so they'll know that I sent you. At the end of this episode, we'll have more information about Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Today's birth story guest is Jana, and she's going to talk about she and her husband's devastating and heartbreaking decision to terminate a pregnancy at 21 weeks when they found out that their little boy had congenital abnormalities and some other issues that were going to be not compatible with life. She talks about that decision as well as going on to have another miscarriage and then two natural births, one in a hospital and one at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanted to preface this episode to just let you know if you're not in a good place to listen to a story of loss, just come back to this when you're ready. All right, let's hear from Jana. Hi, Jana. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Bren. I'm really excited and nervous to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Absolutely. So my husband and I and our two boys live in Saginaw, Michigan. That's about two hours north of Detroit, up in the wedge of the thumb, between the thumb and the fingers, for those that are familiar with how Michiganders tend to describe where they live. Uh, We are transplants here from Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. My husband and I relocated here when he matched here for residency. He is an emergency medicine resident, and we're finishing up our last year here. And then we'll be moving someplace, hopefully a little bit warmer. Somehow I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) Yes, I'm ready for the warmth. But we have a almost two-year-old. He's going to be two next week. And a two-year-old boy, excuse me. And then we have a almost five-month-old, and he'll be four months next week as well. (laughs) So I feel like with the second one, you're like, oh, he rolled over. I should probably capture that. I know. Thank goodness for cameras on our phones or these that are dated. Babies would get <laughs> <And> no <laughs> attention. All right. Well, I know you want to talk a little bit about your journey to getting pregnant and a couple of losses that you experienced. So let's start there. Sure. I'm happy to share about those. Probably early on, my husband and I, I should say, have been married five and a half years. And about a year into marriage, we found out that we were pregnant and we had been trying and we're excited. And I should say, I am also a forensic nurse and have a background in emergency medicine as well. And then my husband was in medical school at the time. We're both like really comfortable in hospital settings and just like the medical process. Like I feel very much at home in an emergency department. A part of me almost would prefer to deliver a baby in an emergency department as much as emergency staff hates that idea. I just feel very comfortable and at home there. So anyhow, I was pretty hands off with my first pregnancy. It took us about a year to get pregnant with him. And when I went in for my 20 week ultrasound, the ultrasonographer actually got very, very quiet and excused herself from the room. And my husband and I at the time both knew, you know, he's in medical school, but we both knew and I had seen the ultrasound. We we knew enough to know something was wrong, but we couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so I was at a just kind of a well woman's community clinic. I had been working with a midwife team at a birthing center, a really well respected birthing center outside Philadelphia at the time. And I had had very much a quote unquote normal pregnancy up to that point. 
So the ultrasonographer had left the room and we both kind of looked at each other because we knew we knew something was wrong. And the physician came in at the time and bless her heart, I think that she doesn't see complicated ultrasounds. You know, she's very used to just seeing very well woman ultrasounds, healthy babies, healthy moms. And she just said, your baby has a hole in his spine. We don't know where, we don't know how severe, and there appears to be a whole lot of other things going on. So this was a Thursday afternoon before a holiday weekend. And she said, we're going to fax your records over to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to their diagnostic fetal clinic, which is amazing. I can't say enough amazing things about them. And they have a study there and they do a lot of work with babies with spine bifida. But as she repeated, but there are a lot of other things that are problematic. And that was kind of it. That was all she told us. And my husband and I had driven separately. He was actually in classes that day. So he'd come on his lunch break to have our first ultrasound. And we hadn't done any genetic testing or anything at that point. And I felt baby moving. And so this was like a huge shock. I mean, it's a huge shock for anyone, obviously. So he, of course, didn't go back to class. I drove home absolutely sobbing, like trying to drive, which I probably shouldn't have driven. But you know, when you like need to be normal. And so I was just like, I'm driving home. I'm driving home. We did get in touch Actually, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia folks actually called us, I believe, that afternoon. And they said, we can get you in here first thing on Monday if you're interested. You need to be prepared for two full eight-hour days of seeing specialists and being screened. And go watch our documentary on PBS, I believe is where it is. Because they actually have done in utero surgeries for spina bifida on babies before they're born. And so you know, of course, we're like, we've got all the books out, we're pouring over things, we're certainly Googling, just because we're medical professionals does not mean we don't Google. We're Googling things, we watch the PBS documentary. And it was amazing, but grim. I don't know if that makes sense. They can do, you know, one thing about medicine is they can do really amazing things in medicine. But sometimes you have to ask yourself, to what end? And we realized too, how impactful that would potentially be on future children as well, a surgery like that. So anyhow, fast forward to an extremely long weekend. I mean, the longest weekend of my life, of our lives. And we went into children's that Monday morning right away. I had playing cards. We had snacks. I mean, we were like ready to be there for days. And they kind of start out with a bunch of imaging of your baby and of you. And, you know, you answer tons and tons of questionnaires. and So I actually had almost a five-hour ultrasound of our baby. And I just kept sitting there. And, you know, at 20, I was close to 21 weeks at that point. You're uncomfortable. You know, you're starting to get to that uncomfortable. And then laying, you know, flat for an ultrasound or rolling on your sides is on a stretcher is just a lot. But, you know, we sat there because I think we both knew this might be our only chance to see our baby. We just sat there and we watched and we talked and it was almost normal. And the ultrasonographer was wonderful about pointing out, I don't want to say she created a false impression by any means, but she was wonderful about pointing out his cute face and look, he's sucking his thumb and just really happy things, if that makes sense. Um, Give me just a second. Um, So anyways... um, We had that ultrasound and then we met with uh, genetic counseling, who is incredible. The people that work in that field are just so smart. It's mind blowing to me, everything they know. And we, several other imaging done as well. And we were contemplating having, they want to do an MRI of your baby, but I have metal in my body and we couldn't get a hold of my oral surgeon that had put in the metal plates to confirm that they were titanium because they were done like a hundred years ago, but we knew they were titanium, but they need a letter certifying it's titanium and it's fine for MRI. So anyhow, they said that was fine at this point. They were going to go ahead. And what's amazing about what they do there is first, we saw people just back to back to back to back to back. We saw MFM, maternal fetal medicine, back to back. We saw the neonatologists right away. I mean, we didn't have time to have a snack. We didn't have, I mean, I barely had time to go to the bathroom. They just kept it. It was like a well-oiled machine. It was the most amazing version of medicine I've ever been a part of. Then they said, okay, we want you guys to go to lunch. 
and then come back here in, I don't know, a couple hours. And during that time frame, while we were at lunch, they actually sit down as a team of 14, I believe, and they look at all of your images and they discuss kind of your prognosis and what they're comfortable doing and what they'd recommend. So that was a very long lunch. I don't think either one of us really ate much of anything. When we went back for that meeting, they sit us down again with a couple of the specialists, which is amazing because if I try to schedule seeing 14 specialists or even, you know, three specialists myself back to back, that never would have happened, never would have gone smoothly. And certainly probably couldn't have been able to do it all in one office in one waiting room. And then through this whole piece, we actually had a nurse coordinator who explained everything to us and answered kind of all of our questions in between. Because you're kind of so frantic, even as medical professionals, you're just so frantic and your mind is going a mile a minute and you haven't slept in days really. That it's so nice to have someone that's like basically there to answer all your questions in the moment versus like having to save them all up till the end. She was amazing and answered all of our questions. We actually still email today. I send her emails of our updates of our kiddos. And we met with a maternal fetal medicine specialist and she actually pulled us. She drew a wonderful, and it was really nice because they treated us not as medical professionals, as parents, which I think was easier for our brains to wrap our heads around what was going on. And she actually showed us like on a body diagram where the hole in his spine was. And there's actually a difference between a hole in the spine and then there's also a hole in the skin as well. And I can't remember the different grading of it, but he had a very large one and his brain was actually already herniating down into it and essentially into his neck. So they were not confident that the surgery that they do in utero, so inside of me, they were not confident at all that it was going to be particularly successful. They said we passed all of our screening markers for the surgery, but they just, they wanted to be very clear with us that the surgery was not going to repair the fact that he couldn't move from essentially the belly button down at this point. They didn't know that it was going to fix what was going on in his brain as far as his brain kind of being squeezed down. There was a variety of other issues going on as well. And they said, you know, you guys need to think about this and decide what you want to do. And then sort of the long-term impacts, which I think people don't necessarily think about are, you know, he was going to have a, to have a shunt placed in his head basically immediately at birth, if he made it to birth. And that was going to be a, you know, a surgery, the first of many. And so he would have had a surgery potentially in utero with me. And if he survived that, another one at birth, which once I had that surgery, I believe they did it maybe 26, 28 weeks. I was going to have to stay in the hospital. They would not let me go home until 32 weeks when they would have delivered him via C-section. The way they do that surgery is they actually cut into the top of your uterus. So kind of more up by your breastbone. I mean, not that far up, but at the top of the uterus. And then they do a C-section in the normal C-section spot. And then you have to guarantee and sign waivers saying that you will not get pregnant again for two more years because your uterus is very weakened by both of these procedures, obviously. I would say that that documentary, I wish I remembered the name of it. It is pretty amazing. But again, it doesn't repair sort of the, I hate to word it like this, but it doesn't repair any of the damage that's already been done. It really potentially, if it works, just sort of slows or stops damage from continuing further. So, and as I mentioned, we had other other things going on in his brain as well. So after a long, I mean, it felt like an eternity. In reality, it was like 24 hours. You know, we both decided that we were going to terminate this pregnancy. And that was a really, really hard decision from a lot. I mean, obviously, from a lot of perspectives. I have a religious Christian background, and so I sort of had all of that wrapped up into my thought process. And that was something that my husband heard me, but didn't quite understand that portion of it. He's incredibly supportive. He hadn't had the upbringing that I had around that. So we didn't even know what to do. We were so overwhelmed. But you know, for us and this decision, we felt like we were making, you know, as parents, we're called to protect our children. And and we really felt like the selfless protective thing to do 
with, um, sorry, <laughs> I've told the story a lot and haven't gotten quite so emotional. We felt like what we needed to do and what was the best decision for our family was to terminate. And that was obviously an incredibly challenging decision for the two of us. And I wouldn't wish it on my enemy. <laughs> it was a horrible time. Ultimately, I went and had a, it's called a dilation and evacuation when they're so far along. That process, which don't Google it. <laughs> I would encourage anyone to Google it. But I can't tell you how incredible the care was that I received. I can't tell you how incredible the care that we received and that I received at the hospital, actually Abington Memorial Hospital outside of Philadelphia around that termination and how much they supported us. And I was really, really concerned about the snide comments and everything like that. And oh, we didn't experience any of that. People were incredibly kind and thoughtful and extremely trauma informed in their care because my husband and I were wrecked. I can't say enough good things about that hospital, which sounds weird. <laughs> I know. I feel like that's been like the theme of your entire story is just how much you appreciated the medical professionals guiding you through this. Yes, very much so. As medical professionals ourselves, we were allowed to be parents in that moment or in those moments. And additionally, it changed how we cared for patients. I mean, it was incredible for my husband, especially he hadn't even started residency yet. And it's changed the entire way he treats moms and dads, moms and moms that come into emergency departments and have miscarried or are in the process of miscarrying. And he actually is comfortable treating those patients and treating those parents because he's been there and he understands. And, you know, people, <laughs> We joke now, and it's definitely a way of, you know, coping sometimes, but we're like, people say the dumbest stuff when things like this happen, when you miscarry or when they, they hear your whole story about, I mean, this whole process. We've only told a few people this entire process, but now all of your listeners get to hear it as well. And it just changed the way that we do medicine, both of us, and the way that we care for patients. And certainly, we both have a soft spot in our heart for those parents that have to make those decisions. What's ironic in this whole process, or I don't know if it's ironic, I'm not even sure that's the right word, but we have had several friends or friends of friends that have reached out to us, either to me or my husband, who have found out, because we've said, we'll happily talk to anyone that's in the same position or similar positions. And we're happy to talk through, I mean, I could talk for an hour about kind of how we came to the decision of terminating and we're happy to talk through that with any parent that's interested because it's an incredibly hard decision. I mean, it's just an impossible decision to make. And sadly, I've heard a lot of stories and I have a couple of very close friends that have had similar situations and they have really received some really terrible care and very traumatizing care on top of something that's already so hard. So we feel very lucky and blessed that we had such an amazing experience. And as I said, we really can't say enough good things about a place that is so painful for us. Like both of those, you know, facilities obviously have mixed emotions around. But again, we had such an amazing experience. And I'm so thankful to those medical professionals that helped to make that. They didn't make it any worse. Let's put it this way. And medical professionals can make things <laughs> so much worse. We've heard some of those stories on here too, unfortunately. So I appreciate you sharing that perspective. Absolutely. And we named him Finley. His name is Finley. We have a picture of him and we still very much think of him as, you know, our first son. So we have three boys and one is not on earth with us, but our other two are. So... Moving forward with trying again, and I know you had another loss that we're going to talk about. What were some of the things that you did to process what you had been through and where did you find support? Yes, totally great questions. 
therapy, first of all, is an amazing place to start. I think everyone needs a therapist at some point, even if you don't think you need therapy, just maybe go check in with one (laughs) so that you have established care. Because at some point, you're probably going to need one for some situation in your life. I saw a therapist and then she saw actually both myself and my husband. And, you know, it's really interesting. We got a whole slew of, you know, some of it, you know, you just need to trash and not listen to. And then others is actually helpful. (laughs) You know, I think it was actually my dad who said it to us. He said, you two, this is either going to bring you together or absolutely rip you apart. So you need to cling to one another. And that... I have repeated (laughs) to several of our friends that have experienced losses and at various stages in pregnancy. And I think that's probably some of the most helpful, quote unquote, advice that we receive. I'm trying to think what other advice was probably most helpful. I think probably the other advice is just giving people grace that they're going to say just really dumb stuff. (laughs) They're going to say really dumb stuff to you. And so, I know that's hard because you're just so emotional in the moment and things are so hurtful and comments that are meant to be really helpful are not. So I think probably for anyone that has a friend or you know family that's experiencing a lot while you're listening to this, I think if you're not really certain on what to say, I think the best thing you can say is nothing and just to be supportive of those parents. And maybe even saying like, I don't know what to say. And I don't want to say anything that's hurtful because you know that that's not my intent. And I've said that to friends, like I can say, I'm sorry a million times, but it doesn't make this any better. And so I'm just here to be supportive and listen. And I think that's probably, at least in our experience and everyone grieves and heals differently. That's probably the most helpful advice I would give to anyone that has people in their lives that are experiencing or have experienced loss. So yeah. Yeah. Just from seeing friends go through this as well. I always say like, be there, let them know you're there for them and like, keep checking in because they might push you away. It doesn't mean they never want to see you again or be your friend. It's just, they need space. And if you don't check back in, that's, what's going to hurt. So. Right. And I really appreciated those text messages and even voicemails from friends that were like, you do not need to call me back. You do not need to text me back. That's how they'd started out. But I'm just calling to say that I'm here. And if you need me or if you, you know, need us to walk the dog or (laughs) drop off wine, you know, whatever, we're here. That was such a nice thing to hear, but then not have the pressure of having to like call people back. Because that's the last thing you want to do. And quite honestly, the other thing, if I had one more flower delivered to our house, and it was so kind of people, but I will never, ever personally send flowers. My milk came in. I mean, like I was in the process of trying to suppress milk and I was covered in peppermint and cab. I don't even know what all I was doing. I was doing peppermint shooters, peppermint tincture and drinking peppermint tea. And then I got my ice packs. Like, but I mean, it was like, it wasn't even out of National Geographic. I don't even know what it was out of. I mean, it was just terrifying. And I'm dealing with, you know, we lived in a walk up at that point. So I'm trying to like, let delivery people in just where we live, they couldn't leave it at the door. And it was just like, too much. (laughs) So I guess maybe think about If you are going to send something, think about where they live or maybe wait a few weeks and send something. But that's my other thought. I realize that's not what this podcast is about. But I just have to say as someone that was trying to suppress milk and was like, had ice pack bindings in and frozen cabbage, it was just a lot to then also deal with this poor delivery man who just, I think was like, what on God's green earth is going on with this woman? You know, it's just a lot for him to take in. Yeah. Okay, so then what did it look like for you guys as far as making the decision to try again? And how did that go? What's great is that once specifically about Children's of Philly is that once you're a patient of theirs, you're always a patient of theirs. So we had a lot of great support from them. And I could call or email them at any time, kind of as the dust settled a bit, and ask my questions. And basically, their only recommendation because spina bifida is I mean, I say spina bifida, but to be clear, there was a whole slew of other things. But our only recommendation essentially for us 
was just increase your folic acid intake. I had been taking prenatal, but some people just need a whole lot more folic acid, both myself and my husband. So we, to this day, still take, I think, like 4,000 milligrams of folic acid a day. In fact, that's one of the suggestions we tell any of our friends when they're thinking about getting pregnant. We're like, just start taking like a ton of folic acid as well as prenatals, because this is just one less, you know, thing you can take off the table. (laughs) They assured us, they were like, you know, we're not trying to diminish Finley and this pregnancy, but we have this happen all the time. And people come in and they have completely wonderful, quote unquote, normal pregnancies after this. This is really kind of, it's not one in a million, but this is probably your odds of this happening again are pretty rare, especially if you're taking all the folic acid and stuff like that. So that was, you know, sort of reassuring. You know, my husband and I both, you know, we were kind of spending a bizarre amount of time together because he was in medical school and then I was working pretty much remotely. So I was at home a lot. And so when he'd be home early from classes and stuff, we just, we spent a lot of time together. I really loved that time early on in our marriage, you know, when we were young and didn't have kids and just had a dog and could just do whatever. (laughs) Watch a lot of Netflix. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what we used to do with all of our time. (laughs) Now I feel like we don't have any time, but you know, we just talked through it and it's like, we still want more kids. And, you know, at that point I was 33, 34. We're both very aware of, you know, quote unquote, advanced maternal age. We didn't feel like we needed to wait or really delay much. And our care team agreed. In fact, they said you can go back to seeing your midwives at your midwife, you know, your birth center and all of that. And I was really excited about that because I still really, really felt like birthing can really be done very safely in non-hospital settings, et cetera. And we'll get into that more with my birth story or my subsequent birth stories. And so I was really excited that that at this point hadn't sort of been taken away from me, taken away from us. And that was really helpful too, I think, in the healing process as well. So anyhow, we started trying more or less right away. And I think it took us a little less than a year. Oh, yeah, it took us. It was much quicker than that. It was very quick. It was like a couple of months and I was pregnant again. And then we got another blow with that because actually I started, we're in Chicago for my birthday, it was kind of that weekend and we were just going to have a quiet trip. And I was super early on pregnant and we were just going to have a quiet trip to Chicago and see a couple of friends and eat some good food. And it was going to be great and nice, calm birthday. And my birthday was Finley's original, was his due date. So that's another fun... I actually really like that memory now, but (laughs) I didn't for a long time. But I actually started bleeding on my birthday and on his birthday as well. And I was just like is this the worst joke in the world? It just really triggered both of us all over again. And it was terrible. And again, another moment I wouldn't wish on my enemy. And so we just went on through that. And I called a girlfriend of mine who's actually an OBGYN. And I was like, she's like, happy birthday. I was like, I'm bleeding in Chicago. I can just chill, right? I mean, like, I don't need to go into a hospital and like have a DNC like here. And she's like, no, just go home. And, you know, if you don't have any of the things to be concerned about, you know, you know what those are. (laughs) She's like, you can probably just pass this by yourself and just go see your midwives, call your midwives and go see them, you know, next week. And I was like, okay. So I'm like in a hotel room, like in the Kempton in Chicago, (laughs) just miscarrying and like this on my birthday weekend. And we're just like, this all just needs to end. Fast forward. And actually, everything that was a pretty uncomplicated miscarriage, you know, my midwives were very confident that nothing was wrong and this would all be good. And we just needed to, you know, trek forward if we still wanted to try to have kids and just, you know, just take care of ourselves mentally and physically. Anyhow, we actually ended up a few months later, we went to have some fertility testing done just to make sure that there's infertility issues on my side of the family. And we didn't think there was anything going on, but we were also, we knew we were going to be moving at that point. And I really loved this fertility clinic. It's a natural cycle fertility clinic in Washington, DC, which was near where we lived. And I really wanted to make sure blood levels and sperm counts and all that were fine. And then we just kind of continue on, but that we had established care from them if we decided to do something before we relocated for residency. 
And this physician, this fertility physician that we went to see, he actually saw, he actually saw my sister and it was so kind going to see him. And I know that sounds crazy, but it was such a refreshing experience. And again, another nod to like kind, compassionate healthcare professionals, because here we'd been through all of this. And then, you know, we're totally paranoid that something's wrong and that we're never going to be able to have children, biological children. And he's just like, y'all calm down. (laughs) I still remember. He was like, you just need to calm down. He said, you have been through so much in this last year. And he said, physically, Jana, you've been through a lot. Emotionally together, you guys have been through a ton. And he just said, and can I just put into perspective that this is the fourth year of medical school. (laughs) Rest level is so high. I work in a very stressful job as well. He's like, I am happy to help get you pregnant tomorrow, but like, maybe we just give this a little bit more time. And it was really nice to have him say that and like put it into perspective a little bit for us, especially from someone that obviously like deals with fertility issues day in and day out. So that was really encouraging. Just said, let's readdress this in a couple of months. Like go enjoy the holidays, have a good time because this was early fall. Just have a good time, eat, drink, and be merry. And let's readdress this like January, February. And we were like, that sounds great. So we did that. And actually, we were going to start with just some... We were thinking about IUI. He wanted to start me on letrozole for that. And actually, the way my husband's schedule worked out, he was in a really demanding rotation that month. And we weren't going to be able to get him down in time. And you know, all these things weren't going to work out. So we just said, let's actually bump it one more month. Well, that was the month, I believe it was February or March. I got pregnant. We both were shocked that it happened because I think to a certain extent, it was on our minds, but not totally on our minds. And then we had been apart so much, like physically been apart because he was in Philadelphia and I was in Washington, D.C. and just hadn't seen each other. So that was a big surprise. And then we were faced with, oh my gosh, we're going to be having a baby in a new city where we didn't know anybody. And right when we were moving, I was going to be pretty close to 20 weeks, which as anyone knows from this podcast, from several other (laughs) stories, that 18 to 20 week mark, if you're moving, is very challenging to get anyone to take over your care at that point. So we additionally also found out we were moving to Saginaw, Michigan, which I, of course, immediately started like Googling birth centers and looking at like, where am I going to deliver this baby? And, you know, just we were anxious to begin with because of our, you know, past experiences. And I just started crying because there was no birth center. I couldn't find really any like midwifery practices. There was pretty much one hospital choice. There's another one not too far down the road. But I just, there was no like prenatal yoga. I mean, I was so upset that there was just like no resources for pregnant moms or very limited. So I sort of started panicking and, you know, my husband sort of was feeling terrible that he was moving me to this place where we just didn't have a whole lot of birth options. So I said, okay, I'm going to stop trying to panic here and I'm going to start by calling a doula. So I called a doula and she was amazing. She was like, okay. So I explained to her like basically our whole story. (laughs) I sort of explained everything that I just explained to you in this podcast. And she's like, I have the perfect OBGYN for you. And I said, okay, are you sure? And she said, yes. So she gave me his information and told me exactly like his nurse and everything to write down. And she's like, he also practices with a bunch of midwives in that practice. And I was like, okay, that's the more silver lining. This could get better. And so fast forward, we moved here. And actually, right before we moved the day I got on a plane and actually moved here, but on a plane directly from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, because, you know, once a patient, always a patient. So I actually was able to go in and they did a complete, they do a really intense ultrasound and they measure, I mean, we're talking like they measure fingernails of your baby and they knew our history and everything. And so we didn't have to go through explaining that to a new maternal fetal medicine doc, anything like that. And then I had that scan and they were so kind and excited. And our nurse coordinator was just like, I told you this was going to happen. Like everything was going to be okay. And that you would have a healthy pregnancy. And I was like, I know I didn't believe you. (laughs) And she just said, I know no one ever does. And she's like, I want to see those pictures when the baby's born and everything is going to be fine. And I just remember thinking, okay, I hope you're right. 
And if I say this enough, it will be. (laughs) So I got on the plane from that appointment and we came and they sent all my documentation over to my new OBGYN, who it turns out only accepted me because he went to medical school with the MFM doctor that did my write-up at Children's of Philadelphia and actually thought how incredibly thorough and amazing this record was and thought, okay, I guess this woman has had some comprehensive care. She's okay to take. I'm very thankful for that physician for writing such an amazing note, you know, amazing record. I started care with him and I really liked him. I really, really liked him. I still really like him. And we just continued on. My options were going to be at our hospital here. And then with that doula that I told you that I met. So that's kind of where we were until we moved. All right. So do you want to share anything else from that pregnancy or go ahead and share the birth story? I'll make a couple of brief comments about that pregnancy. You know, it felt somewhat different and I was extremely anxious, you know, even till the 20 week ultrasound, we had all kinds of genetic testing done and it all came back fine. But a lot of what we were concerned about issues that you can't actually see or diagnose till 20 weeks at that anatomy scan. So we were a mess and I didn't realize how anxious I was about that 20 week. So that's real. That is definitely a real thing. I warn anyone about that. So yeah, literally when I say we take one day at a time, we take one day at a time and then we would get to the end of the week. It was like, okay, one more week down and we kind of do a mini celebration, but then we really took it like day by day and week by week. Like that is just how we move forward. And that's how we move forward with our following two pregnancies. And I was really sick. I was very, very sick barfing. And fortunately, my barfing only usually lasts till about 12, 14 weeks. And of course, it's not in the morning. It's all day, random parts of the day and eating constantly. Like I just remember at like 2 a.m. sitting at the kitchen table, just like crying because I was so tired of eating. (laughs) I was just like, I don't want to eat anymore. (laughs) I'm so tired of eating. But that was the only way to like make it better. (laughs) Yeah, I got to stay on top of it. So that's about it. Other than that, it was a pretty easy pregnancy. I did, I mean, easy as pregnancies can be. I am one of those people that is so grateful to be able to carry my babies, but I do not love the pregnancy process at all. And I have some pretty significant hip pain, which actually got a lot better once I learned about pelvic physical therapy, but I'll talk about that later. (laughs) So yeah, that's probably it from that first or that, I guess that was technically my third pregnancy. So how did this birth go for you? Yeah. So this birth, my plan all along was to have an unmedicated birth and The reason why that was the decision I made, I wish it could say because I wanted to feel like a natural earth goddess and a birth high and all of that. No, that was really not my plan. (laughs) That was not what I wanted. (laughs) I am terrified of anything related to spines. So like an epidural and the thought of like when I assist with lumbar punctures and stuff on patients, I get so sick watching it. It's like the thing that I just don't want anything to do with. I almost passed out in nursing school watching an epidural get put in to a pregnant mom. I just like, I knew that that was not going to be a great plan to manage my pain because I'd probably have a heart attack (laughs) in the process of getting the epidural because I was just going to be way too in my head about that. My solution was I'm just going to have natural childbirth because an epidural cannot be my plan for pain management. That was kind of the extent of my thought process around that, which I realize is probably kind of strange, but that was my plan. So I went in 40 weeks on the day and my OB stripped my membranes and I was only dilated. He's like, you're maybe a centimeter dilated. And he's like, I can kind of strip some membranes. And I was like, sure, fine. You know, it doesn't make a difference one way or another. If I'm ready, it might spur things on. If I'm not ready, it's fine, whatever. And I actually didn't find it particularly painful. I know some people say it isn't. I mean, it's not comfortable, obviously, but it was fine. Also, I would like to say I was in pretty bad right hip and lower back pain. So I sort of think that's why I was so excited to be in laborers because I was like, I'm going to get this baby off my hip. And so that was pretty motivating for me. Anyhow, so he stripped my membranes and then I just was like going on throughout the day. And I knew people experienced a little bit of cramping and stuff after that. So I had some cramping. And then probably about seven, eight o'clock at night, my friend here, she has a zillion children. She texted and said, how was the appointment? And I said, it was fine. 
I'm still having a little bit of cramping, but I'm sure it's nothing. And she was like, are you timing those cramps? And I was like, timing them? Bryn, I'm a nurse for heaven's sakes. Like I went through labor and delivery rotation. Like (laughs) I was like timing them. And I know my doula told me about this, but I think this should probably tell you the level of denial I was in. I was fine that I was now pregnant, but you know, that I was going to be in labor. And so I was like, no, I'm not timing them. These are just cramps. And she's like, well, maybe time them. Do you have an app? And I was like, an app? And she's like, yeah. So she sent me one. And so I was like, uh, she's like, just do it for me for like a half hour. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I started doing it. And, you know, I think I texted my husband and I was like, oh, I'm a little crampy because he hadn't been at the appointment. He'd been at work like pretty much ever since I had gotten home from that appointment. And I said, I'm a little crampy, but I'm sure it's nothing. I'm going to go to bed. And he was like, okay. He said, can you trust track those for a few minutes and let's see. And I said, sure. So I screenshotted the tracker and sent it to him. And he's like, do you want me to come home? And I was like, what is wrong with you? Do not come home. We live like four minutes from our hospital here. I was like, you are not starting vacation early. I am not in labor. Like you finish out this shift. (laughs) And he was just like, okay. And so he said, why don't you send me another screenshot in like an hour? And I was like, I am not going to, because I'm going to be asleep. I'm exhausted. Like I'm so tired. And he was like, okay. So we just kind of went through all this. So little did I know that he's at the hospital with all of his colleagues and they're looking at these screenshots that I then subsequently sent a couple of times. And they were like, man, you got to go home. (laughs) And he said, I cannot go home. My wife will kill me if I come home before the shift is over because she doesn't want me to use my vacation if she's not actually in labor. And they were like, she's in labor, man. The woman's in labor. You got to go home. He texted. He's like, I think I'm going to come home. And I was like, you are on shift until one. I don't know. It's like one or two. I was like, you best not come through the store before then. He was like, well, I guess I'm going to either she's going to drive herself to this hospital or I'm going to, you know, and I'll meet her here or, you know, I'll just run home and get her, whatever. He just decided it was probably best if he actually like did not come home till he was supposed to be. So anyways, I was starting to maybe think in my mind that I was in labor, but I texted my friend in Germany because she had texted me and, you know, the, the time difference. And she's like, Janet, you're probably in labor. And she's another nurse friend of mine. And she actually is one of the reasons why I had a home birth. She inspired me to do it, but down the road. But anyhow, she said, you need to go eat something right now. And I was like, Kate, I am tired. I'm going to bed. I mean, I was being so difficult. I was like, I'm going to bed. And she's like, you need to go eat something you're going to wish you had. And I was like, I am exhausted. I'm sleeping. So fast forward, my husband gets home from work and he comes in and he's like, okay, what do you want me to do? And I was like, go shower and go to bed. Like, just go to bed. And he's like, should I pack the car? And I was like, no, no one is having a baby tonight. Like, this is not happening. No one's having a baby. We're all going to sleep. And mind you, it's probably about 1.30 in the morning at this point. So he goes and takes a shower and climbs in bed. Unbeknownst to me, he was actually like pretty much dressed while laying in bed because he was like, we are not going to be home for very long. And so I think he'd laid down about a half an hour and I like sat up in bed and was just like, you know, I was like breathing and I was like, how are you sleeping at a time like this? And he was just, I'm up and he was fully clothed and ready to go. And I said, I guess I'm in labor. So he's like, oh, good. I'm so glad we can like acknowledge this now. So we started tracking and he said, you know, I'm going to give the doula a call. And so we touched base with the doula and she said, you know, call me when they're a little closer together. And and that was fine because my intent was I really want to labor at home for as long as possible. And then we have the luxury of being so close to the hospital. So the doula got here about, I think, 5, 5.30 and she came upstairs and, you know, again, as usual, I don't know why this never registered to me, but I was like, I am having so much diarrhea. I think it must have been something I ate. I mean, Bryn, I was so delusional. I was so delusional that this was happening. <laughs> I was just like, I've had so much diarrhea. And she's like, yep, that's preparing your body. And I was like, is it? I mean, <laughs> it was like everything I learned ever in nursing school had just gone out the window. Finally, I don't know, probably about six o'clock. She was like, you know, I think it's probably time for us to head towards the hospital. And I was like, I do not want to go. I don't want to be there very long. I don't want interventions, you know? And she's like, yeah, I know. I think it's just time. You know, it's like that doula sense that they have that like, you got to get going. So I was contracting all the way down our stairs out to the car, got in the car, That is the worst. I mean, I don't know. I hear about all these women on your show that are amazing and do like 45 minute car rides to hospitals. And I am like, 
how did they not just like jump out car windows? I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I often hear that that's like the worst part is oh. being in the car, especially if it's like, it sounds like you were in pretty active labor at that point. So I just like my hats off to any woman that's in the car really ever during the laboring process. But as I said, we live like four miles away and we live in a town that after like, I think 11 p.m., the lights actually start flashing instead of they're not stoplights just because no one's awake and out. So my husband decides to stop at every he's such a wonderful rule follower and it's good. I married him, but he is like stopping at every light between here and the hospital and like every stop sign. And I was just like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is not a time to be following any kind of rules. You know, we live in this small town. Why did we move here if it wasn't to run these, you know, these stop signs while I'm in labor? So anyhow, we pull up and he's like, I think this is going to get real here in a minute. So he gets me a wheelchair and is like, leaves the car, you know, at the curb is pushing me in. And I'm like, I can't sit in this wheelchair, but I've got to somehow get up, you know, to the fifth floor. So we get up there in the elevator and I, you know, nurses, we are the worst patients and just such a pain. We can be such a pain as patients, but I will tell you, and I have to be cautious here because, you know, it's a small community, but it's almost comical to me when a mom who's like, I'm unmedicated, you know, we want a natural childbirth and I feel like I have to push it cracks me up that they're like, it's fine. It's your first baby. You can just hold it. You don't need to push. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so that was basically, that was at 630 in the morning when we arrived. And she said, oh, and we'd forgotten my purse, which was entertaining. It was right by the door, but you know, we forgot it. Thankfully, I was sort of pre-registered. But the nurse said, you know, oh, it's your first baby. You're fine walk on over to this scale and stand on it for me. And I'm thinking, I told her exactly how much I weigh because I'd just been waiting at my OB's office that afternoon. And she got really snarky with me because I wouldn't stand on the scale while it was doing the ounce calculation. You know, it was like, beep, 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 doing, <laughs> it's like trying to, because I'm laboring. I was like, you know, moving. And so I just got off the scale and she's like, I really needed an accurate weight. And it was like, all I can do, you know, my husband works at this hospital. So I was like trying not to be crazy. <laughs> yeah. In that moment, I like envisioned myself like smacking her and being like, what weight based drug are you about to give me <laughs> that accurate of a weight? And then, you know, the usual get on the stretcher, we need to check you. And of course, I'm just like, I cannot get on the stretcher. It's so hard, you know, everything that stretcher is like, the most daunting thing when you're in labor, you're just like, Oh, this is terrible. So I get on the stretcher and she checks me and I already had opinions about being checked because, you know, I think it's overutilized, but I understand there's time and place for it and it's policy and blah, blah, all that stuff. So she checks me and she's like, you're only at a six. And I remember thinking, how crazy do I have to act for someone to just hit me over the head with a two by four and I'll wake up and this will be over. <laughs> that was all I could think. I just kept thinking, if I am only at a six, this cannot be possible that I'm only at a six. I looked at my doula and I said, I feel like I have to push. And the nurse just said, don't push. You're going to tear your cervix and everything. And I just remember thinking, that's fine. I'm never doing this again. You can have my cervix, uterus. I don't even care what you take out of me tonight, but you can have it all. I have to push. And for any mom that's felt that urge, you can't control it. I mean, it turns animalistic, I think. And it just, it's instinctive and you just start to push. And so she's lecturing me about not pushing. And I'm looking at my doula and my doula just with her words to me, with her mouth, you know, because it's before COVID when we didn't have to wear masks. She just looks at me and she just words, push, push at me. And I was like, okay. So I just started pushing and the nurse says, let me check you again. And she goes, Oh my gosh, you're a 10 now. And I thought, Bryn, it had been like 30, 45 seconds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe I'm miraculous. And I go from a six to 10 in 30 to 45 seconds. I'm not sure. I'll let the audience decide on that one. So then they start screaming. I mean, this woman's in labor. We're pushing. We need a room. Call a doctor. You cannot push any longer. We need a doctor. And here I'm thinking, it's fine. I've got my doula. I've got my husband. I can catch this baby. Like, this is all going to be fine. I don't care if there's a doctor here. Also, nurses, you're amazing. You can catch babies too. Like, you know, it's the part of me that bucks like the systems, if you will. But anyhow, 
I pushed four times and probably about the second or third push, I was trying to roll over onto my side and the doctor came in at this point. It was not my OBGYN, it was another physician in his practice. So I was like, I need to deliver on my side. I was just trying to get off my back because I was so terrified. You know, I knew all the stuff about pushing on your back and all that. And I was like, I just need to get on my side, mostly because I knew I couldn't get onto all fours at that point. I was never going to happen. And both her and the nurse, the physician and the nurse grabbed my feet and like pushed them into stirrups. And they said, no, you need to deliver in stirrups. And I was like, what, what planet are we on? First of all, that I need to do anything (laughs) that you are telling me I have to do. And second of all, that I have to be in stirrups. And then I pushed one more time and he was out. And that was at 642. So we were in labor and delivery for 12 minutes before he arrived. Now, I will say I tore badly with him because I still will believe this till the day I die because they had me in stirrups to deliver. I tore really, really badly. I mean, it was a second degree tear, but big and big and juicy and awful. So, but it was great. I mean, there's a baby. And of course, you know, they put this thing on your chest and, you know, fortunately they're pretty good about, you know, the golden hour and all of that there. They're pretty good about that. But they put this baby on your chest. And I just remember thinking like, this thing is mine. Like, oh my gosh, like he's been inside of me for so long. We knew it was boy. And, you know, I was so relieved. You know, my husband and I, this is going to sound crazy, but we both like checked his spine because we just, we wanted to make sure like everything was closed and it looked good. And I was looking at my husband and he was just like, oh my gosh, you did it. And I was like, I don't even know what just happened. It like kind of happened so quickly. And I think by the time I wrapped my head around being in labor, you know, I was pretty far in. And the healing process from that, I think that's pretty much it for the birth story, like directly related to the actual birthing. I was pretty irritated with the physician and the resident that actually had insisted I be in stirrups. Uh, I did tell them the only reason you all put me in stirrups was because it's more convenient for you. And they both just kind of, and of course I said this as they were sewing me up, which probably wasn't like my best, but I felt like they needed to hear that. And I don't know if they actually heard me with that or not, but I just was super irritated. And I did write that in all of my reviews, like about my experience was like, you all need to be way more friendly to alternative birth positions, especially when you do have a mom that's not medicated and doesn't have an epidural and, you know, anyhow. Yeah. Yeah. That was a whirlwind birth for sure. It was really quick and the recovery was pretty rough with the sutures. In fact, I had to go into my OB, I want to say about two weeks after, and it was just all like my body had rejected them. They were all just like a snarled mess in there. And he just pulled them all out. And he's like, I think you just need to heal naturally because these sutures, I don't think were done right from the beginning. And I was like, awesome, you know. (sighs) So yeah, that was that experience. I mean, typical postpartum, new first time baby. And I really struggled with breastfeeding. I had had a breast reduction when I was like 25. And I would just say that I don't think a lot of the lactation consultants around here are very versed in what to do or how to handle that. And I do feel pretty robbed about my first five or six weeks with Griffin. That's my baby that time around because I was so stressed about getting him fed and he lost all this weight. And I mean, like a lot of weight, like he was born 7'10 and he was down to like 5'10. I just had so much anxiety about not being able to breastfeed him. And then kind of, I do think that a couple of lactation consultants I talked to gave me very false hopes of this actually working and that someone just needed to tell me, give him a little formula. It's all going to be fine. A fed baby is best. So ultimately... I finally got him on formula and it was amazing. <laughs> and and I pumped for a while and I was only ever really pumping about two ounces a day, but I kept that up for a bit till he was about four months. And then I actually had a friend that gave us some of her breast milk to get him out pretty much the six month mark. We did a formula and breast milk to get us to the six month mark, which was amazing of her. She's an overproducer and shared that freezer stock with me. <laughs> So that's birth story number one, I guess. 
All right. So we have one more birth story to share. And this one was, like you said, just five months ago or so, and it was during COVID-19. So do you want to share just kind of what was different about that one because of the pandemic? Sure. So as everyone, I think, who shared about COVID related birth issues is that, you know, our hospital was forever changing policies. One day, you know, doulas weren't allowed and they were allowed. The hospital up the road was allowing them, but she wasn't allowed at our facility. So we really just got to thinking, especially because of the birthing experience at the hospital. And it was, you know, 12 minutes, as I mentioned, but I didn't want same birth experience that I had. I wanted to be allowed to deliver how I wanted to deliver. I felt like if we delivered at home and my husband felt this way too, you know, I was a low risk pregnancy. My OB was actually hundred percent supportive. I mean, he wasn't going to be there, but he was happy to continue seeing me simultaneously with my home birth midwife that we'd hired. And so we just felt like we could control the variables a bit more here And if something did go wrong, you know, we do have the luxury of living four minutes from the hospital. And then of course, I mean, my husband's a physician. And so I think probably that was an added layer of comfort for both of us as well. But we felt like it was the best decision for us based on, you know, I was really worried they were going to decide one morning that he was high risk because he was still seeing patients and that he couldn't be up in labor and delivery with me which I wouldn't have blamed them certainly, but I was very concerned he wouldn't be at our birth because he was, you know, potentially exposed to COVID patients. I mean, he wasn't potentially, he was actively getting exposed to COVID patients, of course, with, you know, protective gear on, but I just thought they may not let him come up to labor and delivery because he's high risk. And at that point, they weren't allowing doulas either. So we just sort of decided that we were going to because I was low risk, I think my OB being so supportive of it, it was like, okay, let's do this. Knowing that four minutes from here, we do have the hospital and that we have that luxury. So that's sort of how we came to the conclusion of with COVID, keeping that in mind, how we got there, how we ended up with a home birth. (laughs) Yeah. So were you glad that you made that decision and everything went well? Yeah. I didn't know that you basically take your first birth and cut it in half for your second birth and so on. And so (laughs) my midwife was like, you need to call me the second you feel a twinge. And I was like, what? (laughs) Because this birth is going to be so much quicker. And here I'm thinking, my gosh, the first one was so fast. She was not kidding. This one was like four hours, like cramped to delivery. It was barely four hours. And it was fast and furious. I mean, I went from like zero to 60 fast, very, very quickly. (laughs) But the home birth experience, you know, as I said, ours wasn't very long. My, my laboring wasn't very long, but having a baby, I think in your home, I mean, it's just amazing because you're so comfortable and it's your space and we were prepared and you can get all of the, I mean, you literally like order it on half the stuff on Amazon and another half of it from this birthing website. And it just all comes to your house. And you know that part's really, really easy. And I don't think home birth, certainly it's not for everyone, but if you have low risk and that's something that you're interested in and you're comfortable with, you know, I don't know that I would have been comfortable with it for my first birth experience, but I for sure was for my second, especially when I added the risk factors and really thought through COVID-19. And we still don't know tons about it, but we really didn't know a lot about it back in June either, and particularly how it was affecting moms and babies. Yes. I mean, that birth was really, really quick, just laboring at home and my doula here and my midwife and her birth assistant and just like delivering in our house. And then like they leave and it's so nice to be at your home, you know, showering in your own shower and just, I'm kind of a germ freak anyways. And so I was just like, not worried about wearing flip flops back and forth to the bathroom. And so it's just such an incredible experience. And I think probably the biggest difference about, and this is probably midwife versus, you know, sort of the delivery I had the first time around, you know, I kept waiting for them to like pull, we named him Dashel, but Dash, I kept waiting for them to pull Dash out of me. I was like, why aren't you pulling? Cause they're like, he's crowning. Okay. His head's out. And I'm like, why is no one pulling? And they were like, he'll deliver himself. And I was like, what? I just didn't have that same pulling and like, you know, getting the baby out of me experience, I got the baby out of me. And it was incredible. 
And my midwife had told me, and I thought she was crazy at the time. Cause if you, you know, as I mentioned, we didn't hire her until I was like 33, 34 weeks, which she normally doesn't do, but she did. She had said, if you listen to what I say, you most likely will not tear. And I thought you are crazy, but whatever, fine. <laughs> And you know what? Sure enough, she coached me through it and she was like, okay, you need to stop pushing and breathe for a second. It was a different stop pushing than, you know, at the hospital when they're like, stop pushing. We need a doctor. She was like, okay, breathe. And then you slowly start pushing again. But she's like, we don't want any babies being shot out of you. And I was like, okay. And she really talked me through the whole thing because I was terrified. I mean, I literally when I was pushing, I was like, I can't, I'm so afraid I'm going to tear again. And I can't tear again. And she was like, just listen to me, listen to me. You're doing fine. Just listen to me. And she really brought it back and coached me through it. I did not have one tear when we were all said and done. And he was one ounce bigger than my (laughs) firstborn. So anyhow, that was an amazing experience. And I'm really glad we had it. And I honestly, when I was done with that, I was like, let's have another baby, which I definitely didn't think that I'm not even really sure I was thinking that when we got pregnant with Dash, but (laughs) I was like, that was great. It was such a different experience. And certainly home births aren't for everyone. But I really think that if you're contemplating it, there are so many pros and cons, you know, to any birth you choose. But it really can be is so empowering. And as I said, just the comfort factor of being in your own home, I think almost helps you relax and focus more on the birthing process. And I don't love a ton of people around when I birth. And so it was really nice because like no one was bothering me. You know, I wasn't laboring with blood pressure cuffs on and they were monitoring his heart rate every time, you know, following a contraction, they did the same monitoring, but they don't do it. You know, it's not continuous wrapped around me where they're constantly fighting to get a good read. So it's just, it's a much different experience. We didn't do twinkle lights and candles and have like, I didn't even have music playing, honestly, which I think some people are like, oh, don't you have the birth tub and like, you know, candles burning everywhere. And I was like, no, I mean, we basically just had our house as normal and I had this baby and there was no birth tub. And I mean, you can, of course, make it however you want, but that was just not my style. I think I probably would have been like, this is so weird (laughs) if we'd had all that stuff going, but it was still peaceful and relaxing because it was in my own. I mean, relaxing maybe isn't quite the right word, (laughs) but I could just focus on delivering. And I wasn't worried about like fending off people that were wanting to do things to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, having home births myself and then, you know, visiting my friends in the hospital, the one thing I noticed is the postpartum as well. Like how many check-ins, like you just can't even get a nap (laughs) because there's somebody coming in every, you know, 45 minutes to check something. They're all just doing their jobs and it's understandable, but it was such a stark difference to me with having had home births. And they come to your, like the midwives come to your house for often multiple visits after you deliver, which is like, I mean, during COVID, that was priceless, right? Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah. For Especially anyone. A, a toddler at home too. Yeah, we have a toddler at home. And, and even with, you know, if you have just the one, it was so wonderful having her come to the house and weigh. And I think too, if you're struggling with breastfeeding at all, you know, they can weigh and often help you with that stuff. And they're already coming anyways. So that was such a night. I like, I don't think I realized how awesome that part was until it was happening. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I don't yeah. have to I go anywhere. It's pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. All right. Well, do you have any resources that you want to share? I do. I think the chiropractor really helped me a lot, especially with being aligned. And I saw them pretty much through all my pregnancies. And if you're in our neck of the woods, True North Chiropractic is awesome. The Dr. Hall's there and he's very comfortable treating pregnant women. And then also kiddos. He still sees my kiddos now. And then our doula at Modern Michigan Doula. She's great. Melissa, she was really helpful in just supporting us. And again, allowing us to be parents in the moment and be less um, medical professionals. So that was really, really nice. And, you know, as far as, oh, I'm sorry. Of course, our midwife. (laughs) Our midwife was amazing. And does kind of home births all over this side of Michigan. Jill Roper, she's great. As far as social media, I really liked taking care of babies for sleep related training. Oh, that is magical. I think I've heard some of your other listeners talk about it, but 
Oh man, you certainly, I loved the new, I mean, we were getting good sleep after taking care of babies. I think expecting and empowered is awesome for both their postpartum and their prenatal pelvic guide, just strengthening your core and really being mindful of pregnant women. And we are so different than sort of any other population. My other thought is car seat safety. Oh, I hope you've researched before you try to put that baby in the car seat. But safe in the seat is on Instagram. Those are all on Instagram. Safe in the seat is amazing for car seat confidence and knowing exactly what you need for a baby. So I think those are probably my big ones. And then building blocks family is great. If you have multiple children and you're bringing a new one home, she's got some great suggestions and resources for prepping for baby, you know, prepping older siblings and also some great sleep training as well. And then of course your show. I mean, I've listened to like every single one and I'm a Patreon member. And so I can't say enough about, I think it's really helpful to hear all these different birth experiences so that you hear how different they all are. Right. And so, you know, there's not one birth that's the same. And I think that's really empowering to know, like hear all these different women's stories to give you confidence with your own birth choices. Yeah, they're also different. And I think it's funny that before we started recording, you were like, uh, mine are kind of boring. <laughs> and now that I've heard them, I'm like, um, no, <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's funny. I think they're kind of, you know, I'm like, I just delivered baby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, Jana. Well, did you want to share where people can connect with you? Sure. I'm on Instagram. You know, it's private, but you can message me. I'm at J Frenchy. J and then. French, like the language with an IE on the end. So I'm at J Frenchy and you can always message me there. And that's a good spot to find me. And if I know, you know, if I see that you're from the birth hour, I'll answer. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now we're going to hear more about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor. Don't forget to head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get your free pump through insurance. Aeroflow has been a longtime sponsor of the birth hour, and I've never heard anything but amazing reviews of their service. So the way that it works is you just go to their website and you fill out a really easy form, and then they will contact your insurance as well as your care provider, you know, to get proof that you're pregnant and then to find out what your insurance covers as far as breast pumps. And then within sometimes hours, maybe a day or two, you'll get information from Aeroflow, a link to click, and you'll see all of your options. All of the major brands of pumps out there are available, and you could sometimes upgrade if you want maybe a you know rechargeable one, or you want one with a really cute bag because you're going to be carrying it to work every day, all different options. Um, that are either free or an upgrade. It's totally up to you, which is really cool because a lot of insurance companies, if you contact them directly, they might have like a couple options. So Aeroflow has really just condensed everything into one spot and made it really easy, which is nice. Um, I also feel like they just can cut to the chase with your insurance company because they know exactly what they're doing. It's kind of like, you know, dealing with uh, your car insurance. If you have a lawyer, you're going to get things done a lot faster. Um, so Aeroflow can act as your go-between and it's completely a free service to you, which is awesome. I also wanted to mention they have a couple extra things now that I didn't know about when I used Aeroflow to get my breast pump for free through insurance, and those are their compression garments. So they have compression socks, which a lot of people end up needing during pregnancy. I wore them on an airplane when I was flying to Hawaii, and it was a long flight during my pregnancy. And then they have maternity compression bands to help support your belly during pregnancy. And a lot of insurance companies cover these um products as well, which is really cool. I would have had no idea. I don't think insurance companies are broadcasting this information, but if you get in touch with Aeroflow, they can figure out whether that's something that is available to you or not. There's also postpartum compression garments as well. And you can always buy these things through their site too, even if your insurance doesn't cover them. The other really neat feature of Aeroflow is the services they provide once your baby arrives in the form of sending you, um, like restocking your breast pump supplies, like the bottles and the valves and the tubing and all these things that actually need to be replaced pretty frequently. If you're pumping every single day, um, they will send you a reminder and be like, Hey, you qualify for free replacement parts. Um, and we're sending them out to you. I don't think I even had to 
say like, yes, please, or check a box. I think they just sent them to me, um, which is really amazing. And that's a, another free service that your insurance covers, but you may not know about if you didn't have somebody advocating on your behalf the way that Aeroflow Breast Pumps does. So if you're pregnant currently, you can go ahead and do the form whenever you want. Go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour. Remember, it's totally free and it's an easy form. You can do that whenever you want in your pregnancy, and then depending on your insurance company, they may want you to, um, you know, wait until a certain, like 36 weeks, I think was mine, until they'll ship the pump, but I was able to make all the decisions ahead of time, and then it just shipped when I reached that point in my pregnancy, and Aeroflow kept track of all that for me, which is awesome. Um, Other companies might allow it to ship a little bit sooner. You can also fill it out even if you've already had your baby. I believe when I talked to Aeroflow, they said for most insurance companies, it's within the first year. That might you know, vary depending on your insurance. But again, that's something that they will figure out for you. So if you haven't used Aeroflow yet and you want to get your pump for free through insurance, let's take advantage of our insurance plans um, that we have. Go over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and they will get you all set up. Thank you so much again to Jana for sharing her stories with us and to Aeroflow for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Jana's name in the search bar. Hope everybody has a happy holidays and we'll be back next week with another birth story. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.